Hey guys, welcome to another episode of In Range. However, this is a great collaboration with Atun Shea. And you've already seen Atun Shea on the channel before because we've done collaborations in the past, but we I'm haven't sure done have. them together on the ground in front of an incredible structure. And this incredible structure is the 1811 Andre Plantation, now known as the Kid Ori Historic House. Yep. And this is where the 1811 slave revolt started. It's really interesting to note that how many people don't know about the 1811 Slave Revolt, even though it is one of the most incredible fights for freedom that ever happened on American soil. Well, Lexington, Concord, fights for freedom. Yeah, absolutely. Those people were fighting against taxes. These people were fighting for their lives. Yeah, against a whole lot worse than high taxes, that's for sure. So as we talked about on InRange, one of the best ways, in my opinion, to do history, and I have kind of, I'm going to say, a soft, squishy approach to history. History. you got the books, you've got the academic, and you have to work with that. Mm -hmm. But to go there on site and look at the place and talk to the people and see the people that have done the research and then see the things with your own eyes, sometimes you can come to conjecture, mm -hmm. but conclusions that at least seem to make sense yeah. that aren't necessarily the exact narrative you read in some tome. And so we're doing really multiple videos here. The one on in range is about that part, the soft squishy part, which is what might this have actually been versus yeah. what we've read in some documents. And by the way, the yeah. documents on this are quite limited. Yeah, exactly. This is an event of of great emotional significance. Um, this is a what I would regard as a very important event in American history that has sadly, in the early days, intentionally, but sort of in the later days, just through a lack of serious attention, has sort of been lost to us. There has been very little scholarship done about the 1811 Slave Revolt. Even this museum, which is on the site where it began, it's just kind of a house in a residential neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Neighbors on either side. Uh, there is not much left of the actual structure of, of what it would have been like in that time. So what we're trying to do here in Carl's video is just sort of see what we can glean from just being here on the ground and uh, wildly speculate. <laughs> well, I don't know if I'd say that. I would say let's soft squishy. No, no, yeah, like, yeah, exactly, exactly. The, the, the boots on the ground, like this is what this is what feels right based on the data that we know. Yeah. So you can take data points and then go from there, right? Yeah, exactly. And so exactly. What, what you're going to do is you need to watch both videos because there's going to be yours on your channel, Atun yep. Shea, mm -hmm. and there's going to be this one. There might be even more. But on both of these, if you combine them, I would I would advise you to watch both for sure because you're going to get the more academic, more rigid version on yours. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very, very, very rigid, very hard. Um, True science. <laughs> yeah. Well, what we're going to what we're going to do, I think, uh, is go over sort of. Uh, the, the legacy and the historiography and what actually happened with this event versus uh, what we think might have been likely. So, so people that don't know anything about this, I'm going to give them the, yes. the most brief overview, and we're going to do that on both videos because we have to. Absolutely. So, yeah. 1811, this is a plantation. This plantation had a, a, a relatively smaller number of, of enslaved people, but there was a leader, Charles Deslande, who was a slave driver. A lot of people don't know what that means. What that means is that was typically an enslaved person that was used to force the other slaves to work to take the heat off of the white masters. Like they were the bad guy. Really, they kind of were forced into the bad guy role. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, very much so. this was, as a result, they also had a little bit more trust and power and could navigate back and forth amongst different plantations. Mm -hmm. People think they didn't, like a lot of people think they stuck to only one plantation, but frequently there was a need to go talk to the neighbors or even go into New Orleans, get supplies mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. And Charles actually had a girlfriend over at the Trepanier plantation that he would visit quite frequently and went to New Orleans to Congo Square where slaves would gather on Sundays to uh, sing and dance and sell goods at market, uh, you know, a, beginning a musical tradition that would then sort of become jazz. That's a whole different story. But he had a lot of freedom. Uh, he was a mixed race man as far as we know. And uh, eventually, inspired by the Haitian Revolution, he began to germinate rebellion. Yeah, so the Haitian Revolution is a whole other thing that people really need to learn about. You yeah. know, Toussaint Louverture, who led the revolt in Haiti and literally conquered and destroyed the enslaved people. They, they freed all of the enslaved people and destroyed the planter class in yeah. Haiti. Yeah. Now, the rest of the world conspired against them and made sure that Haiti could not succeed once they had gained their freedom, but that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. But inspired by that and enlightenment type thinking, mm -hmm. uh, Charles decided that this was going to happen here mm -hmm. and started using that freedom to talk to other enslaved people across not only plantations, but also in New Orleans proper. Mm. And on January 8th, they were going to rise up and they were going to do the same thing here. Marching from this place, that house from here, all the way down to New Orleans, sack it and turn this into a black nation. Yeah, into a, a free black republic. So modeled after Haiti. 
No. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, now at some point, we're gonna actually walk through here and show you some of this. We're gonna talk about the actual events and a good likelihood, at least two of the rooms here are where some of it really occurred. Yes. And we're gonna show that. Yeah. And then we're gonna get to the soft squishy bits that I'm talking about and like, here's what I think or what it feels like, also from what we learned today, that this could have been, maybe this is the more accurate portrayal. Yeah, this is actually, guys, it's a very uh, sort of impromptu yeah. video idea because we, We've read a lot of the same materials about the revolt, yep. and uh, I live around here, so I kind of know the region, but kind of getting onto the ground, once we sort of arrived here, what we had read didn't really make all that much sense anymore. Didn't match not, as well as you'd like. Yeah, not in terms of, of grand, broad details, but just the little things. And uh, I guess it appeals to the, sort of, to the, to the pedants in us, uh, <laughs> we're going to go Take them apart in excruciating detail. All right, so if you haven't already watched the video over on Atun Shea's channel, where we get the more like, I'm gonna use the word academic version of the narrative, we're gonna give you here now the, the softer version, the maybe let's think about this moment, right? Yeah. So Charles Deslon comes in here with approximately 20 other enslaved rebellious people armed with cane knives and axes. And they surround, in this room or the other, this bed in which Manuel Andre is just there asleep at midnight, thunderous rain outside. Mm -hmm. He awakes to them, according to the official narrative, being blown upon with these weapons. Somehow, miraculously avoids enough blows that he's able to get out of the bed and flee and escape. In the process, his son is killed, however. Hmm. Yeah, That's... I've always, I'm not gonna lie, I've always found this to be like a little bit weird and a little bit sort of suspicious. I don't think it's impossible. I mean, we, we were talking about sort of the fact that this guy, when he fought against the British uh, in the Revolutionary War, um, uh, not for America, but that's kind of a whole different story. But up in the up in Baton Rouge, uh, he was a militia leader. He was a tough dude. It's not crazy to think that the guy could have just ah it's, it's, and, and gotten out of here. But it's, yeah, it's in the realm. I certainly couldn't have gotten out of that. It's situation. in the realm of probability. But let's also take this. According to this, he's almost nearly mortally wounded and barely escapes with his life. And he's the reason that he's able to uh, educate the people around here that there's this revolt afoot, and that's why the militia is able to m mobilize and put an yeah. end to this. Yeah. But yeah. it's only a couple days later. He's one of the people leading the charge yeah. against the rebellious forces. Yeah when he was mortally wounded with cane knives and axes just a few days before. Yeah. So this is where we get into the softer bit of this. Like of course, if we want to take that, and the curator here is an amazing resource in this regard, but yeah, yeah. Um, what if it wasn't to kill him? You know, this is, I think, a supported hypothesis. In other words, if your victim is asleep in their bed and you have an ax, it's a one and done if you intend to kill him. And we know that they didn't intend to kill him because they let him go in the end. Uh, he didn't fight his way out. Uh, there's no account of him doing that. They just, you know, once they got the information they needed, they just apparently just left. What if it was, this was an example of power over power? This was the man that was enslaving you. This was a man that was controlling your life. This was a man determining if you live or die. This was a man that was determining if you could marry, if you could have children or not. This is somebody who, who controlled your children's lives. So when you take a cultural difference, right? Like when we think of general European combat, it's about killing the enemy. Yeah, but it's, it's, yeah, generally. And, and that was something that, uh, and as many of y'all know, I'm a New England 17th century guy. And uh, that was something that shocked a lot of of Native Americans was the English tendency to just murder everybody. Right. Uh, certainly, you know, indigenous war could be brutal, but it wasn't so much about just extermination uh, as it was about sending a message. Well, I'm going to bring a bunch of different cultures together here, and but 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 an example of that that if, if you're not familiar with this, the, the the practice of counting coup, where you would run up to your opponent and touch them or strike them with a club, not yeah. kill them, and then run back. Yeah, and yeah, this was yeah. a, a very a very common thing amongst a lot of the Native American tribes, and that was an example of bravery. In fact, a way to sometimes earn your warriorship or well, something like that. It's in all the old westerns, right? About like I don't know how true this is, but a lot of natives, you know. I don't know, in Jeremiah Johnson. You know, they, they have to touch Jeremiah Johnson before they can honorably kill them. Is that, there that, any no, but truth can, to that no, or? not so much. Yeah. There wasn't about you have to do that to the person before you could kill them. The, yeah. I mean, it seems like some. There's a lot of wildly sure. different cultural approaches to this, but yeah. counting coup was an example of bravery and warriorship and sometimes yeah. earning your feather and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that was a, it was, it wasn't always about killing, and it was sometimes about showing power over the enemy. Yeah. And yeah. so yeah. 20 people here hacking you with axes and cane knives, or it, it's like, questionable you could fight your way out of that. So the narrative could very well be made that they didn't intend to kill him. 
The son was killed because he came in with a sword and they had to kill him because one, he was armed. Secondarily, killing the son is another example of power over your master. Yeah, absolutely. Master. Yeah. And then you let him go and that's sort of an emasculating thing in that this is what happened to the guy that's been controlling your life for however long. Yeah. Mortally wounded. Uh, after the rebels kill Jaber and impale him on the door and leave to go in search of the militia stores, Andre gathers up his family tells uh, two of the slaves that were there were not participating in the rebellion, you know, to remove his son's body from the door. But also, if they're trying to get information from him, why not torture the son? Sure. And I think it's also easy, this is something I was thinking about today, I think it's also easy for us as armchair generals to, because of course, Andre would eventually raise the militia that mm -hmm would later overcome the rebel army. So I think my armchair general self wants to say, well, why didn't you kill him? He was right there, you had him in your power, you should have just you know, ended him and you would have saved yourself all this trouble. But of course, kind of on the ground and uh, especially given some of these uh, non-European styles of warfare that may kind of not be kind of what we generally think about uh, when we're thinking about strategy or tactics, especially from an armchair general perspective. And we were talking about Native American stuff. Obviously, West African warfare is much different, sure. but still, it was uniquely sort of European to to want to exterminate. Speaking you know, of that, strategically. Speaking of that, the actual rebellious forces didn't were not completely foreign to tactics. They actually evaded the militia and did oh, things yeah. that were very oh, yeah. interesting. Oh, so yeah. this wasn't like they were they weren't so naive as to think that uh, precisely that they would have. I don't think they were. I don't think they were so naive as to say, okay, we thought we were going to kill this guy. Yeah, he runs out the door and they just let him do it. Yeah. Like, wouldn't you send someone to go finish that task right yeah, now? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. really, that's another thing that adds a narrative to they didn't weren't intending to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's very it's a compelling. It's a compelling theory. It's a for compelling sure, argument for sure. for sure. But there are, and the planning is something else you bring up. I mean, uh, and and this is something uh, that it has recently been talked about more, which is awesome. But uh, this revolt was very meticulously planned. It seems almost undeniable. I mean, picking um, a time, you know, the sort of second week of January, eighteen eleven, where uh, the majority of the American militia in the New Orleans area was not in town. They were up in Baton Rouge when it had been raining very heavily, which uh, uh, bogged down sort of roads and communication and also not much work could be done in the rain. So, you know, slaves might not be sort of, uh, there was a bit of maybe wiggle room as far as you've got to be here at this time and that sort of thing and scheduling and all that. Uh, and, uh, and also the fact that it was carnival. Carnival had just begun. Uh, so uh, Andre, yes, he slept in not this very bed, but very likely in this very room. You know, he probably was, uh, it was kind of the type of sleep where... <laughs> <laughs> he might you know, have been having a little deeper sleep yeah, than average. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 But, but you make a good point because the fact that they decided to choose January 8th specifically at midnight or around midnight, yeah. in spite of the fact that it was pouring rain, with the idea, and we're going to get to this later, the idea that they were going to break into the armory and get a bunch of weapons, which are black powder weapons, in pouring rain, if you were going to do this off the cuff, you're like, you know what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm done. Today's the day. Let's just <laughs> yeah. do this. And it's not meticulous. Yeah. You yeah, don't pick yeah. midnight at that time in pouring rain to go get yourself a bunch of black powder weapons. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the fact that they continued through with it on that date is also indicative of that the amount of planning and effort into this and communication, not only here, but across multiple plantations into New Orleans proper yeah, yeah. was legit. Yeah. And it had to happen now because there was no way to wait. Every, there was, you, couldn't, you couldn't bring up your phone and call everybody and say, hey, hold out. Change the calendar to tomorrow. Yeah. It didn't work that way. Yeah. That, that narrative was, it's either going to launch or it isn't. Another interesting example of that, historically speaking, which is not this, but another example, was the Pueblo revolts of the Puebloan people out in New Mexico against Spanish control. They actually had a specific date they were, that was a go date where they were all going to rise up. And they were using knotted ropes. And every day you hmm. would make one knot, and that was one day off the rope. And then when you got to the last knot, yeah. you have to go. 
Yeah, yeah. Sadly, one of the messengers got captured and they figured out the purpose of the rope and it changed the plans, mm -hmm. but they couldn't communicate it. And so the actual assault and attack against the Spanish by the Puebloans turned out to be over two days instead of one day, which uh, weakened okay. some of the, they succeeded, mm -hmm. but it weakened okay. some of it. But that kind of communication was difficult and you couldn't just shift gears in the middle of it. Is that so once Manuel es escapes or is let to leave, mm -hmm. allowed to leave, um, of course, everyone's notified, notified including Governor Claiborne. And in the purpose of that, what happens, what does he do? He, shut, he shuts down the city, locks it up, mm -hmm. but then also shuts down the places where communication normally occurs. Now, he also, as we'll see in other parts of the video, had a Protestant mindset and didn't mind shutting down the bars. But the bars are where the communication channels were. Yeah. And when you see- I mean, even, even to this day here in New Orleans, it's, it's a little bit different now, but I have a lot of friends who were born and raised here who, uh, you know, some of their earliest childhood memories was, was going to the bar with their parents. Yep. Uh, it's because there, there's a social fabric in the, in the bars, you know, um, and even even at that time, you know. But if we take ourselves back and just put ourselves, you know, humans don't change much over time, really. Like, yeah. so 1811 is yeah. really not that long ago, no. but technology's changed a lot. So what do we see in a modern nation state when an authoritarian regime wants to squelch some sort of social movement or revolt? They shut down the methods of communication. Yeah. They yeah. turn off Twitter, they turn off social media, they turn off Facebook, they ban people off yeah, of yeah, yeah. Yeah. YouTube. <laughs> um, and in the process, this that, <laughs> What Claiborne did was the equivalent thereof yes. in 1811. And yeah, when the yeah, communication yeah. chains are shut, the ability to tell other plantation uh, enslaved people to rise up is more difficult. Yeah. The ability to let the domestics, which is the term for the people that were enslaved inside the city, to mm -hmm. do their thing mm -hmm. as part of the revolt is squelched. Yeah. Not that different than turning off Twitter today. Yeah. So authoritarians in 1811 and authoritarians in 2020 are about the same. I had an ironic situation which is that when I wrote the book on Kid Ori, every voice you hear in there, every person I quote is a person of color. Every single voice. I didn't have that to tell 1811. All I had were the voices of the enslavers and the people that put down the rebellion. Okay, so we just discussed the potential other narrative in which yeah. they really didn't intend to kill Manuel. They actually intended to let him go and emasculate him and show that they had power over mm -hmm. him. But the next step of the normal narrative, or the generally accepted narrative, is they then went to the armory because Andre, the Andre plantation was the housing of the, the military firearms, or, or the, the militia's firearms yep. and equipment. And so you hear two different narratives. One, they went to the basement, which indicates it was probably written by someone that's never been to Louisiana because that's not really necessarily a thing. Yeah, although as we have discussed, it's a possibility that it's just sort of a Yankee term for or, maybe a, a, a root cellar. cellar or, yeah. And you yeah. would have that, a root cellar, which mm -hmm. is somewhat underground, not completely because of the water table and moisture, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's cooler yeah. and to keep food preserved in this environment without refrigeration is a challenging thing. So, mm -hmm. okay. But I don't think you would use a root cellar to keep your weapons and your food. And and the trouble is that this house in particular, obviously it's changed quite a bit over yeah, the years, sure. but now that we're just sort of here and on the ground... Might have looked a lot like that. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of the closest thing, and the director of the museum pointed this out to us. This is kind of the closest thing to any kind of sort of underground storage situation that we found. And it looks kind of more like a, like a gardening sort of shed to me. So, so, so there's, you know? to, to, I agree. So to me, but I'd keep my weed whacker in here. So there's a bunch of problems with this narrative yeah. to me when we're talking about, and with the curator. And I think this makes a heck of a lot of sense. Yeah. So first of all, uh, if you were here in Louisiana today in 2021, mm -hmm. the last place I would keep my firearms is under this dank house <laughs> where it's probably very moist and it's going to rust faster than I can put oil on it. Yeah, I used to, I've, I've kept things under my house in yep. New Orleans, and uh, every summer it gets completely destroyed by flood water. So keep uh, them... Mild floods, but it's still, you but know. But still, I mean, we're sitting here in grass, and this is moist earth, mm -hmm. and this is oh, a yeah. very moist environment with yeah. a lot of humidity. Yeah. And so I, I, I have been in Louisiana with firearms, and I'm not kidding, you can sometimes see the rust form on them. I'm not exaggerating. Wow. I okay. believe it, I That's believe That's a real it. thing. Yeah. And so... You're talking about these these military firearms at the time, which would have been second tier, but they would mm -hmm. still have been probably quite in the white. They probably weren't even blued, which is mm -hmm. a preservative. And so these things are going to be very yeah. rust um, prone. They're, they're very prone to rust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. the idea that first of all the militia leader would keep those things in a place where their condition would be questionable at mm -hmm. best, including the powder, is very doubt doubtful. It yeah, doesn't yeah, make yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah. But there's yeah. another big problem with there. Okay. So if he's the militia leader, this is one plantation, and the distance to the next one isn't exactly right there. It's quite a ways to get mm -hmm. a message across. Yeah. If you need to mobilize the militia, you can't pick up your phone and hit the big button and say, 
hey, text the group, come on over here and get your guns because we got a problem. Mm -hmm. that, that doesn't work that way. And they'd have to come to this location where there's an issue. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, there's, who knows what the conflict is. Come here, get their weapons, and get their stuff, and then yeah. go to war. The, the militia then, and the militia concept, was that the individuals kept their weapons. There might have been uniforms mm -hmm. or extra powder or ball, but the idea that the stockpile of weapons is in one centralized location doesn't really relate to the idea of the early frontier militia concept. Yeah. So yeah. while they say the weapons were here and they got them, I'm going to question this at this point, yeah. especially after talking to the curator. Yeah. I don't think they got maybe even one firearm. Which is why everyone would keep their guns close. And if I had 100 people behind the house that I knew weren't particularly fond of me, the last thing I'm going to let anybody know is I got a big box of guns under the house and there's no way to access that without folks knowing it. But they did not, they, whatever they broke into, they might have found uniforms. And we, they, they did find uniforms, we know this. Mm -hmm. They might have found, they did find drums. Did they find guns? I'm gonna say it's, there's a real good chance yeah, they didn't find a yeah, foreign gun. I yeah. mean, yeah, it is. It is not a an established fact by any stretch of the imagination, and in many ways doubtful. Because I mean, yeah, it, you're exactly right. How does a militia work? You know, it's just like, oh, let's all get together, and you know, it, are we talking about minute men or are we talking about all day men? I mean, it's like you know, militias need to be ready to go. Um, so you know, 1811 is not that far off from the American Revolution, mm -hmm. and we know what the concept of the militia was then, mm -hmm. and that each individual brought their weapon and their equipment, and the well-regulated part was that they would drill and train together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. The distance of time, the different distance of militia philosophy mm -hmm. should have been exactly the same. Yeah. And the idea that this is where all the weapons were to me is very dubious. Yeah. On top of that, when we look at what it's actually the end result of this rebellion, mm -hmm. um, when they took fire at the Trepanier house, they did not return fire, which would be something you would do to suppress someone shooting at you. Even if you don't hit, firing at them is a yeah. suppression tactic. Yeah, absolutely. No bullets were fired yeah. in his direction. Yeah. yeah. Right? Then, at the final conclusion of this, when the militia comes in, Andre, who was Manuel was mortally wounded somehow three days later or four, a couple days later mm -hmm. is able to be the guide of the, the, the char lead the charge yeah. on a horse. Yeah, he's, he's, he's in battle. Yeah. And yeah. the casualties are entirely on the rebellion side. No one in the militia's heart. Yeah. Right across the river in Lucy was the home of the West Bank plantation leader. So they meet with him, they summon the alarm, riders sent to New Orleans, people begin to gather there. And remember, the river road and the levee are one and the same back then. So you can monitor what's happening across the river, you know, from the uh, corresponding levee. And then he's part of the attack. So, and he writes a letter to Claiborne. So that doesn't sound like a mortally wounded man to me. Yeah. Not one firearm miraculously, yeah. not one ball bouncing down a smooth bore hits anybody. Yeah. Only, only two. Um, only two white people died in this rebellion. The son? We had Gilbert Andre and we had Francois Trepanier. That's it. That's the act of your opponent, the first person that you strike in a conflict, that always tells you something about the conflict. It always tells you something about the people that are involved, the protagonists. Why did they strike Andre? Well, he was a big deal. He was a big guy out here. He was the main conduit. When Claiborne wanted to talk to the Creole planters, he went through Andre. Um, so he was very valuable in that way. He was commandant of the militia here, and even in, back in the days of the Spanish colonial period, he had been involved in it. Uh, so he was, a, he was a big deal, but he also owned a whole lot of human beings here. And he had become the boss, if you will, of Charles Delon, who had been raised and lived the first half of his life on the Delon plantation, possibly the son of his master. So the fact that, that Andrew is struck first, he's not killed, and that his son is killed, and he's left to suffer with his son dead and allowed to get away may have been a message in and of itself, a uh, humiliation. Uh, and you would maybe associate that sort of having to live with your humiliation with more of what you would see in a West African uh, point of view, or also what you would see in a Native American point of view. And yes. when the militia engaged them, none of them died. Yeah. Now, if there were any firearms amongst the rebellious 
enslaved people that were fighting for their freedom, mm -hmm. the odds of them not getting at least one lucky shot seems extremely odd. Yeah. Um, because the, the militia still would have had to close within close enough distance mm -hmm. to be effective with their weapons. Yeah. And yeah. once they're in range, well, once you're in range, they're in range. Yeah. So yeah. Even you are if, in range. Even if you yep, you are in range, but even if you, even if your training didn't educate you to know that when you yeah. should fire, by the time they're firing on you, at least that's a good clue. This is when you shoot too. Yeah. And so that didn't happen. So if there's no casual, or even on, not even your training, just I mean, you know, it just makes what sense. what I would do as somebody who is not terribly skilled in the arts of war is, close. oh my God, someone's shooting at me, right, right. just and, out of terror and you know self defense. And there's n no casualties in the militia. Yeah. So I very think, strange. I think, I think that while the written narrative says this, it's it is a pretty, it's not a hard jump of logic. Yeah. No. Not at all. They didn't not find any guns. Yeah. yeah. That it wasn't about their inability to use them; they just yeah. didn't have them. Yeah. And that when the militia closed in on them, they brought the guns with them that they yes. had, yes. which is how militias work. Yeah. And then just slaughtered them. Yeah. Simple as that. No, and and I also think that, and it is sort of interesting because yeah, again, we just don't have the, the you know, Battle of Gettysburg or Battle of the Bulge or Battle of the Somme type sort of uh, uh, mountains of documentation about this battle. You know what I mean? It's not. There's there's. There isn't, for, there aren't first hand, account, hand accounts, even from the planter militia, saying like, this is exactly what went down. This is where I was. I was up on this hill. There was a rebel over here. I shot him. You know, there, there is no detail. No, and, and whatsoever. Clay, Claiborne himself tried to downplay the actual, yes. um, yeah. the actual reality of this event because this event really was huge. Yeah, and, and, they, and they, they had a chance to succeed. Yes, and if they had succeeded, this would have changed this entire infrastructure. It would have overthrown parts of this country's social structure. Yeah, which um, we been like need Haitian, to get into in a little bit. It would have been like the Haitian Revolution all yeah, over again. Yeah, and yeah. so downplaying that was a way to make sure that's like, no, we're good. I have it under control. Everything's cool. Yeah, exactly. And also like being part of a an ad hoc sort of, uh, uh, you know, plantation owner militia and putting down a slave rebellion, that's not terribly honorable. That's not the sort of thing that you, that you sort of brag about or write down. In fact, you know, the sort of, um, uh, it was sort of, this idea of like black masculinity of of sort of the the cowed slave at the time mm. was uh, considered exceptionally dishonorable in 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 you know white American society. So there really was no incentive for the victors in in the battle, in the eventual battle, to uh, to you know talk a whole bunch about this or write a whole lot about it. No, it was an embarrassing moment. It was an embarrassment exactly. Yeah. And when Claiborne uh, made his reports and. Uh, and in a lot of the official dispatches, I mean, he used the word banditi, uh, bandits, basically, like just, you know, again, depriving the rebels of uh, their status as an army and, and, and also depriving them of, of political purpose. So Claiborne using this word banditi to describe them deprived them of that. It depicted them as, uh, you know, as just highwaymen and thieves, and you know we're gonna we're gonna come out and we're we're wild and we're crazy and we're we're just gonna be you know hitting people over the head and taking their stuff and you know carousing and, and that's what that word implies, right? It implies a, like a piratical group. It's telling to me that the fact that this is so little known to, in most people's historical knowledge today. Yeah. Is to this, even to this moment, yeah. um, is how effective Claiborne and their efforts were to suppress this. And this is a, a very excellent example of what I refer to on InRange as intentionally induced historical amnesia. And also it speaks to the powers that be because it goes to show that this being suppressed as something that's very important for us to acknowledge as a fight for freedom on American soil yeah. is not on everyone's tongue, is shows where the power still lies. So at that point, this is this is like first of all, I love collaborating with you on this. I love that we could do this yeah, in dude. person Absolutely, instead of just yeah. over Zoom or whatever. We're yeah. here on the ground, and this is you can't, you I can't I can't say this enough. I've said this in other historical videos. Yeah. If you can get to the place yeah. and talk to people and see the location, that's the only way you can. I mean, you can't ever get to the truth. Historical is is like uh, is not a fact based exercise no. to, to quote bad religion. But um, but the reality is is like the, the closer you can get, the better. Yeah. And, yeah. Of course. And going yeah. to the site and talking to the curator and talking to people that have done that homework mm -hmm. and seeing the actual physical location is where you can get closer. Yeah. To that. To that. Absolutely. Un, 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 unobtainable thing. Yeah. Yeah. But in that regard. Um, I'm appreciative that we were here. I'm very appreciative to John, the curator, for getting us into this beautiful home to yeah, see yeah. this. Yeah. I want to thank him for that. We're going to be links below, and you should come see this if you're down here. Yeah, if you're in the area, and, for sure. And this is where I got to do my thing. Got to remind people, like this kind of stuff, 
doesn't get monetized very well at all, especially on in range because in range mm -hmm. is Patreon only. Um, only view the viewers like right? you. Viewers like you. Thanks, and uh, and you have a Patreon as well. I so do. If you like this kind of like really hard approach to history, which I think we both do in different yeah, ways, yeah. but like I think that's important, and there's a lot of creators doing that. That's not YouTube's thing, the algorithm's thing. So please like, share, and subscribe. But if you really like this, consider supporting Auto and Shay or in range or both uh, via our Patreons because it's really there that keeps this kind of narrative alive. I think what is really valuable, of course, a lot of what we've done in this video is just sort of speculates based on kind of you know, logical conclusions, just being here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, you know, a lot of it, you know, don't sort of take this as hard fact necessarily, but I think we did have some like pretty compelling, interesting ideas. I agree. And it's always, like you said, Carl, it's always so much better to just be at the spot and it gives so much more of an understanding of history. And, and while you, it's complimentary, right? You need that hard research, but sometimes you just got to like come out to the spot and look around. And sometimes you got to not focus on the numbers and the dates and you have to remember that people are people and humanity is humanity. Yeah, without a and doubt. if you think about what people do and what their basic desires are and then put that into the place of where you're standing and looking, sometimes revelations come uh, yeah. that are missed when you're just looking at a, a book or scrolling over a map. Yeah, absolutely. So, man, thank you for having me out here. Yeah, and Working dude, together course. on this. It's been yeah. amazing. I hope we're going to do a lot more of this kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, I'm sure we will. So, again, like, share, and subscribe. Support either channel or both on Patreon if you really like this kind of stuff. And uh, most importantly, thanks for watching. To white folks that come here that maybe are feeling perhaps what, you know, is called the fragility or perhaps they're feeling they don't know how to feel about this. Um... I'm a descendant of slavers on Bayou Lafourche. My ancestors own hundreds of human beings. I'm not responsible for that, and their sin is not mine, unless I fail to acknowledge theirs.